Chairman of the Guildhall Library. I just want to say a few words for, uh, a welcome to you. Just to say that, uh, just in case you don't know, uh, Guildhall Library has the largest public collection of cookery books in the country. We have over 10,000 cookery books here, well, cook, food and wine books, um, including the collection of Elizabeth David, 900 of her, her own books, uh, the Andre Seymour collection, uh, the Christopher Driver collection, and uh, we're very pleased to uh, sort of announce really that we've uh, just received the um, Arabella Boxer collection. So um, Arabella wrote to me about a year ago and said she was looking for a home for her books. So I, I snapped them up and uh, with them um, she rather uh, modestly said, would you like to be interested in her working papers? And I said, yes, of course. And so we have um, lots of her research papers for um, some unpublished material, but also book, uh, papers relating to uh, her English food book and her articles for Vogue. So every copy of or copies of her articles for Vogue, including those wonderful um, photographs that came with them. Um, we also have the Guild of Food Writers collection, which is a, a growing collection where um, anybody who's a member of the Guild can donate or bequeath or just give us any of their books that they um, uh, no longer require, and uh, we will add them to collection. We, we don't take duplicates, but if, if there are any duplicates, we, we can agree with the person giving them to us that we could, we could sell them in order to look after the rest of the collection. Uh, we have the Masters of Wine collection, and uh, as I say, this amounts to the largest public collection in the country. They're, they're freely available to absolutely anybody, so anybody can come and use them. It's not limited to uh, anybody in any way. Um, you can just come in off the street and look at this material. We can produce it from our stores within about uh, 10 minutes. So it's a huge resource, and it sits amongst a, a large resource of history items relating to the history of London, the history of the rest of the country. So there's lots of, lots of social history, which so if you're researching around a particular subject, you can uh, research around the social history of a particular aspect of food or drink, etc. So you're all welcome to come and use the collection. Um, if you need any help, just contact one of the staff, and I'm sure we can we can help you look at the material. So, without more ado, which is my favourite phrase when we're introducing the speaker, I'd like to introduce Gillian Riley, who's going to talk about uh, food and art for us today. Thank you very much, Gillian. Thank you. Thank you all for coming all this way on such a horrible evening. <laughs> it's heroic of you. Oh. What I'd like to do tonight... Can, can you hear me, by the way? Yes because I'm not very comfortable around microphones, so if I get inaudible, just let me know. Oh, that's a lot better, isn't it? You can see the colour now. Good. Well, what I really wanted to do was chat a bit about the adventures I've had over the last few decades, looking for information about things to eat in the fine arts. It varies from picture research to illustrate a book, to collecting a lot of pictures and then joining it together loosely with the text, which is what I've done with food in art. Um, we've got an inspection copy over there and some flyers, which enable you to get it at a discount. And since it's so heavy, you won't have the chore of carrying it home. <laughs> anyway, I rather... I wouldn't say upset, but I puzzled the publishers because I didn't want to write yet another history of food and then find pictures to illustrate it. I wanted to get together a selection of images which would show what the resources were in the fine arts to give us more information about food history and that would complement or sometimes contradict textbooks and um, manuscript material and stuff from different periods. So I amassed hundreds and hundreds of mainly unsuitable pictures. <laughs> we got together and had a great triage. <laughs> told them it was like drowning kittens. <laughs> you know, I, I can't, I can't part with that one. I, I won't. Anyway, it all came together in the end. So I thought I'd rush through with you, looking at some of the items that are particularly interesting. This painting by Crivelli is not a food painting at all, but it is full of things to eat. It is a religious subject. It's the Annunciation. You can see the 
holy dove coming down on its flight path into the Virgin's house. And an awful lot more is going on too because it's not just a religious subject, it is political as well. And it was commissioned to celebrate the granting by the papacy of a limited form of civil, civic independence to the little town of Ascoli Piceno in the Italian marches. And here we have, I'll show you details later, but good news was brought to them by a carrier pigeon, not some of these pigeons up there. This is Crivelli showing off his incredible, stunning perspective. And we have <coughs> the townsfolk enjoying their brave new city. We have the patron saint and the angel Gabriel. And we have peacock, among other birds. Or, and also, various interesting things on the shelf above the Virgin's bed. Let's look at some of the details. This is the balcony at the back of the picture on which two of the civic fathers are standing, looking self-important. One of them is holding up a letter. It's the letter which came granting their civic independence. It came all the way from Rome, which is quite a long way. A man on horseback would have had to take several days. This came by carrier pigeon. And you can see the carrier pigeon. You could if I could get this red block to work. No. Oh. So you've got your finger over the light. <laughs> That's better. <laughs> right, so here we have a cage on the balcony. And in the cage is the weary pigeon resting at last night's home. And they are reading the message. And this is all carefully built in by Crivelli's clients as part of the picture. If we move on, we find these curious objects which are at the foot of the painting. What are they doing there and why? Are they part of the five a day of a <laughs> newly pregnant middle class housewife from the marshes? What are they doing? They are symbolic. The apple symbolizes the fruitfulness of the virgin, and the cucumber signifies the purity of her son. And they're put there specially to reinforce the message of the Annunciation. The shelf over her head is full of interesting things, and most of them look like being good to eat. There's a jar on the left with a sort of little paper cap to it, which probably contains preserved fruit and syrup. Then the wooden box underneath the stack of white bones probably contains cotoniata, which would have been made from quinces in the locality. And then the flask has some kind of eau de vie probably, or maybe a good grandpa in case of midnight hunger. And the books are always said to be, oh, works of devotion, works of devotion. But I was thinking, this was painted in the 1480s. Could they not have been manuscript copies of Maestro Martino's cookery book? They would have been even more used to her than the works of devotion, I think. <laughs> I mean, with no means of knowing what's in them, but this is the sort of madness that overtakes food historians <laughs> um, start reading things into things. Here comes the peacock. What is he doing there? Well, we know that peacocks flourished as part of banquets and great feasts. But this one is sitting here not as interior decoration along with the herbs in the pot and the um, carpet and the general affluence of the building, it is symbolizing two things. It's symbolizing imperial power and it's symbolizing also the incorruptibility and immortality of Christ. This was because the flesh of, of 
pigeon, um, sorry, a peacock, doesn't go off fast. So uh -huh. you can keep it around quite a time, which is not quite the same as immortality, but it's getting on that way. <laughs> and they made good use of that by serving a peacock. Um, they didn't pluck it and then roast it when it would have looked just like any other old bird. They skinned it with all the feathers on the skin intact, took the bird out, roasted it, spit roasted it, covered it with spices, and then covered the breast with gold leaf, and then sewed it back into its plumage and presented it at the table. This is from a manuscript describing a wedding of some nobility, also in the Italian marches, and you can see how the peacock has been um, supported on a... Where it's gone again. You can see an iron rod between its legs, which is what's keeping it upright. And if you were really fancy, you could also insert a clockwork mechanism inside the bird so that it could be made to walk up and down the table. <laughs> so that peacock in the painting is a reference to much more than just a beautiful bird. The next image is something completely different. Here it's a case of what you see is what you get. We don't have symbolism and hidden meanings at all. This is a family making a ricotta, which, as you know, is not technically a cheese. It's made from the whey, which is left over from making cheese, and you heat it up with a coagulant several times, and then it solidifies, and is put to drain, and you can see the um, perforated pot on the table and the ladle that's been used to make the ricotta. But the thing about it is, once it's freshly made, it should be eaten straight away on the same day. And the ricotta we buy in Italian delis here has been pasteurized and given whatever treatment it needs for a long shelf life. And it's just nothing remotely like the freshly made ricotta that you can find in Rome and in parts of Italy. This is from a manuscript Taquinum Sanitatum, which is a late medieval Latin version of a 9th century Arabic medical handbook. And it was produced in about the 1380s for the Visconti family in Milan in an artist's studio. And really, if there had been coffee around in those days, and a table to put the coffee on, this book would have gone on that table. <laughs> it, it could almost be said to be the first coffee table book, because the medical text, though concise and interesting, um, is condensed at the bottom of the page. I've deleted it from this. And the pictures take over. And they are charming examples of everyday food and drink. The taquinum was about everything to do with human health, states of mind, states of the weather, and mainly ingredients and things to eat. And so here we're getting contemporary Northern Italian people preparing contemporary Northern Italian food. Another one here is um, such fun, I thought, because what is happening is he's preparing either cured or solid back fat in a way that Martino describes in his cookery book. He, so many of his recipes for both stuffing and meatballs and stews start off with lardo or hard fat, cured, salted or plain, cut into little dice, that's how he <coughs> describes it. And you think, what was this? How did it happen? And we, it always worries us because lard is soft, so how can you cut lard into dice? Well, lard, of course, doesn't mean lard, it means bacon, mm -hmm. cured fat, hard fat, sometimes with meat attached. And here we have the whole thing explained visually in a delightful way. Once we're looking at butchers, 
um, things get more complicated. Again, is it what you see, is what you get, or is there more to it? For years I used to think this painting by Artson was a butcher shop. And the thing for us food historians to do is to count the different kinds of sausages and note this and note that and note the proportions of fat to lean and all the rest of it. And it was just a butcher shop. And then I came across the work of a very learned American historian who had researched the background to this painting and found that there is far, far more to it than things to eat. It's a reflection of the status of the builders' guilds in Antwerp at that time and the status of some fairly shady um, deals in land and property which were encroaching on the meadows where the butchers grazed their animals before slaughtering them. So there's all kinds of local history um, up here about properties to let. Um, so, something there, which I've forgotten what it meant, but a tremendous amount of um, information and detail reflecting local politics and local um, property development and so on. But, so we have to put this in the context of much deeper studies than just looking at pictures and counting sausages. Um, th this is one of the things that I think using the fine arts as a source for information about food is it has to be interdisciplinary because we can't on our own cope with all the material that needs analysing and researching. Charlotte Horton is the name of the academic who did the background to this and without it I think the picture has less value. But there were several versions of this painting so it obviously meant a lot to the community and the butchers in the community. Here's a completely different butcher shop. Um, the Artson was Antwerp in the 15th century, 15th, 16th century. Here we are in 16th century Bologna, Anibale Caracci's butcher's shop. And the interesting thing here is not just the details about the quality of the meat and the way it's been prepared, um, but the fact that the butchers are decent, hard-working, respectable members of the community doing a worthwhile job and doing it with dignity. And this, I think, was quite important to Karachi. But why did he paint this? And there is a slightly smaller version of it too. Because it's, it's very big, it's almost life-size. And if it has, has been suggested it's a family group, um, one of his uncles and a cousin were both butchers. Why go to the enormous expense and trouble to produce what is virtually a family snapshot? So there's some confusion. Again, um, work has been written about this painting, researching the social and economic position of butchers in Bologna at the time which sheds a great deal more light on this. But it's the two factors, I think, that we don't quite know who it was painted for and why, and the fact that the butchers at work are shown with such respect for the dignity of their profession. Um, sorry this is a bit fuzzy. Um, this is Ceruti, and a contemporary of Karachi in Bologna, and you can see he's presenting these butchers with their nudging, leering, winking, ho 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 <laughs> visages uh, as comic characters. It's even been su suggested that they might be characters from the Commedia dell'arte. Again, we've got a vast amount of information about meat, but a completely different take on the purveyors of meat. 
and an even more different, more disturbing one here. This is Goya, mm -hmm. and this is meat on a butcher's slab. Mm -hmm. And what we gather from this is that this was a living creature that we have slaughtered, murdered for food for us. That's the message behind this, not to um, look at those lovely chops. And if you consider the background to that painting was the Peninsular War in Spain going on at the same time, Goya really was linking this um, slaughtered animal with the mindless slaughter and cruelty of the Peninsular Wars. I think we need to escape from this, and what more wholesome than a vegetable <laughs> store. This is one by Bacalar, and he did several versions of this. I think this is the one in the National Gallery, or in the Hague. But the interesting thing is that you've got vegetables from across the seasons. You've got the um, plums and pears of late summer on the right. You've got hothouse grapes, and we'll come back to them later in the middle. And then you've got strawberries and cherries, which are early fruit. And then down on the left, next to the turnips, you've got a bowl of mulberries. So it's a bit like Tesco, really. <laughs> from all seasons and all countries spread across one um, idealised butcher's um, green grocer's store. This is what happened when the enthusiasm for that sort of painting moved from the Low Countries to Northern Italy. Mm -hmm. And this is by Vincenzo Campi. And here again we have the same spread of seasonal foods right from late autumn to backwards to early spring and again the bunch of grapes let's just go back a bit um, you can see the grapes at the top of the painting on the red tray now did dutch or flemish fruit stalls really have an abundance of hothouse grapes it's highly unlikely. So what they were doing there, they were symbolic. They were symbolic of two things. Um, fruitfulness in a married woman and virginity in a young unmarried woman. So that you can link this with the possible present or future of the young market woman. The well-known symbolism of the grapes and here she is again. She's holding a bunch of grapes in a sort of almost hierarchical manner, as if she's pointing out the symbolism. I don't know whether she is or not, because in Norman Italy at that time, as you could see, the grapes came along in great tubs and barrels. So I think there is probably less scope for symbolism in this painting than the previous one. But we have got some very interesting information um, looked at just as historians of fruit and veg. On the bottom right hand corner you've got the native local cabbage with all its many virtues. And in the bottom left hand corner you have two new posh trendy vegetables artichokes and asparagus. Here is the cabbage in all its glory, and here we have the artichokes and the asparagus. Just coming onto the scene, this would be the 1580s, and it was about that time that Isabella d'Este was writing to her agent in Genoa saying, I want artichokes, I need lots of artichokes, get me some. <laughs> And in the fullness of time, this was what happened. From being a luxury crop, it became quite well cultivated. Here we've got it early on in the Takuinum, where it, although it's obviously a cash crop, there's a field full of it, it's rather spindly stuff, but it does give you an idea of the quality of asparagus cultivation at that point. And this is 
late 17th, early 17th century, early 18th century Holland. Um, and you can see the difference in the quality of the experiments. Um, so again, um, looking at paintings for all kinds of different reasons, you can come across you know, you could be writing a thesis on the history of asparagus and asparagus cultivation, and you could go to all sorts of unlikely paintings like this one and find just little clues that help. To get back to the artichokes, this is quite an early version. It's from the Villa Farnesina, <coughs> the loggia, which was painted by one of Raphael's pupils. And what is going on here, you can see on the architectural detail, is a mass of fruit and flowers and vegetables, like those up there and down here. This um, series of paintings was a quite deliberate um, celebration of fertility and fecundity. The, the painter's patron was Agostino Chigi, who was uh, a very rich merchant banker in Rome in the early 16th century. And he was not only having, insisting on having these very naturalistic fruit and veg, but he was also um, full of really quite rude symbolism about fertility and fecundity. Here is Ceres, the goddess of harvests, and it gives you some idea of the voluptuous qualities of the painting. Then we have this, and I have it on good authority, but amongst all the phallic symbolism, and, and it's easy with cucumbers and so forth, um, these black grapes actually represent pubic hair. I think we move quickly on to something <laughs> a bit more chaste. This is from the same work, um, Baby Leeks or Baby Spring Onions, which takes you back to the Takuinum, where again, a couple are preparing their vegetables for the market. The artichoke was still, at this point, an exotic vegetable, and it was painted for Ulissi Aldrovandi, the naturalist, in conjunction with one of his pet monkeys, so that you've got the exotic vegetable and the exotic animal um, portrayed together. But by the time you come to Giovanna Garzoni, which is a whole generation and more later, she was painting for the Dukes of Tuscany. And she's, you can see in this painting, she's deliberately showing three different varieties of artichoke. So again, if one were doing a thesis on the cultivation and development of different kinds of artichokes, one would be moving from natural history illustrations to these. Um, they're, they're described as miniatures, but these are in fact life size. And I can't detect any symbolism in this. Um, <laughs> try as I may, although Giovanna Garzoni, the artist, was a very religious woman, and I think sometimes we get a fly crawling around on a rose which might symbolise corruption or sin or something or other, but I mean, flies happen, don't they? So, <laughs> um, here's another example of completely unsymbolic vegetable, just as well, I should think. It is a giant squash. Um, Cosimo, the Medici Duke, collected monsters and special examples of things. And anyone who had a giant turnip or a giant carrot, or in this case, this giant squash, would send it to him in Florence. This came all the way on a donkey cart from Pisa. You can see the leaning tower in the background there, indicating where it came from. And you could see from the sultry sky, it must have been pretty hot, heavy weather. And you could see that the um, great squash is only just beginning to deliquesce. 
So mm. the painter, Bartolomeo Bingby, um, received this monster. The, by the time it got to the city gates, a crowd had gathered and followed it through the streets, calling molto strepito, with a lot of din. So he had to set to work immediately painting it and recording it. And he had a brilliant idea, because if you eliminate the um, slice from it on the left, it's really a pretty dull subject. But this golden glow of the interior lights up the whole thing. Here we have a totally different vegetable put to a totally different use. <laughs> um, these are cabbages and they are used as temporary heads for people who have come to the baker of Atrio in the Low Countries who acquired a reputation for helping people who were funny in the head. <laughs> what he did was remove the head, wrap it in dough, <coughs> and replace it with a cabbage. And the afflicted and tormented people who were brought to him would then sit comfortably in a nice upright chair, waiting for the dough to cook in the oven, by which time they could have their head screwed back on again and rejoin the human race. This seems to be perfectly credible in that the baker was probably some kind of instinctive natural healer. And I think anyone coming into a baker's shop feeling perhaps troubled and uneasy, sitting there for a while in the warm atmosphere and the beautiful aroma of freshly cooked bread is going to feel better. And I don't know the origins of the legend behind this, but it seems to me that there's a lot of humanity in it. More humanity in this one. We're looking at apples now. And here's another Dutch market store, um, complete with the grapes, as you see. And all sorts of things can be read into this. Um, the three ages of women, you know, the little girl, the mature mother, and the horrible old crone. The apple which the little girl is holding, why is she holding it? What's happening there? She bit into it and it was bad. The old lady had sold her a bad apple. And the little girl's mum is um, expostulating, while the little girl is hamming it up and making the most of the drama, as you can see. <laughs> So on one hand you get these morals and different significances in the thing. And the grapes, I mean there is the mature mother um, with her happy, healthy, smiling daughter and the symbol of her fecundity um, all mixed up together. And one is really seriously grateful for the root vegetables in the bottom right hand corner, bringing one back down to earth. Again, more symbolism, another Dutch mother. And what is she doing? She is peeling an apple for her little girl. And why is she doing this? Because the role of the virtuous Dutch housewife is to bring up the daughter in a spirit of good Christian belief. She's teaching her children how to behave. She's teaching them the difference between right and wrong. And the apple there is a symbol of both. It's a symbol, as we saw earlier on in the Crivelli, it's a symbol of the fecundity of the Virgin, and it's a symbol of badness, because it was the apple that Eve used to seduce Adam and got them kicked out of paradise. So we've got an apple that's got quite a big burden to carry in this painting. It's a relief to turn from the sunlit uplands of the very virtuous household to young stains. This is just a detail of the household in disarray. Um, we all sympathise with this, I think. <laughs> the children are feeding a pie to the dog or the cat. Mum has had a drink or two and is now <laughs> having a little smoke. And life is wearying anyway. But if you look down there, you can see the 
pot of coals which she used to light her pipe is about to set her skirt on fire. And you've got the daughter who is, I wouldn't have thought, 100% stone cold or sober, um, teasing the parrot, and the parrot's got lots of symbolism, which I'll spare you. But she's holding in her hand a pretzel, which could be used as a means of, again, separating right from wrong. Two people took over the pretzel and each pulled. And it became a sort of game and whether one had the biggest bit and go to heaven and anyway, the jug on its side without a lid, it's very bad news indeed because it signifies loss of virtue. And when it's associated with young women in paintings, you fear the worst. <laughs> Here again, to get away from symbolism, which drives me crazy sometimes. I just want to look at the real thing and not tease out the hidden meanings. What we have here, I haven't found any other example of anything quite so interesting. She's making apple turnovers. <laughs> she's got the raw pastry in her hand, which is a pie, um, which I think she's in the process of filling, and these little turnovers. And the apple itself, which has been cut up into little sections, which you see in the bottom left. Another fruity painting. This opens up a whole area of research that I haven't gone into, but um, guild members who are concerned about child nutrition and child welfare and the bringing up of children and the role of food in it could find an amazing amount of material in studies of virgin and child because some children which were intended by the painter to look lovely and poshy and healthy are sometimes showing symptoms of deficiency diseases. <laughs> I think not in this case. What worries me is, well two things worry me, one is it's this living dangerously, it's not terribly well wrapped up <laughs> and he's been given a pomegranate to read. What is a child who hasn't yet been weaned doing um, munching on a pomegranate? <laughs> you do wonder the results could be potentially catastrophic. <laughs> but you see it's because it's a symbol again. It's a symbol of fertility and fecundity and the seeds with their red globular juice around them and symbolize the great community of Christian souls. So that the baby Christ child is carrying quite a heavy burden. Here's another child, also I think not terribly well wrapped up, <laughs> about to reap the, consequ the consequences of that because his family, this is supposed to be a fish store and the fish are accurately portrayed but a bit low key. But the family on the left are eating boiled beans and they are giving boiled beans to this poor child and they are full of mirth at what they can see, as we all can, are likely to be the inevitable consequences. <laughs> Here again, you don't have to be a paediatrician to see what's going on here. This is a portrait of the artist's daughter, and you can see from the staring eyes, the flushed cheeks, the rosebud mouth which is open and emitting a fierce of shriek, and the little feet drumming away on the case of her baby carriage, and her podgy fingers. What are they doing? They're crumbling biscuits. She's been given them to calm her down, and of course the excess of carbohydrate and sugar has had absolutely the reverse effect. These are the cookies she would have been crumbling. A wonderful painting by Clara Peters, and a gift for the food historian where you have recipes in books about how to make these cookies, but no idea of what they really look like. And Clara Peters seemed to specialise in um, 
paintings with cookies and pies and sweetmeats and things. There's a fair amount of symbolism going on in here. The sprig of rosemary for remembrance, the betrothal ring, and the sweetmeats in the shape of a cross there, which has been done quite deliberately. It's like the herrings we saw earlier on in one of the butcher paintings. This is more homespun, these um, cookies and biscuits. And again, I don't know what you're supposed to draw from it, but the melancholy look on the little boy's face, I think, implies that he's there to have the biscuits run, not even himself. <coughs> While we're on the subject of confectionaries and baking, there's a whole range of different kinds of pies in Dutch still lives. You can see that this is a still life with luxury goods and hothouse fruit. The citrus fruits would have been imported and very expensive. And the centre of the composition is this amazing pie. And if you read recipes for pies in Robert May, the English food writer. You get a whole range of interesting and extraordinary fillings, including not just meat, but dried fruit, um, oranges. Here's a close-up of that detail, and you can see that there are pine kernels in the stuffing as well. And I think one could go on to find out a lot more and correlate it with recipes of the period. Note how the pie has not been cut into elegant slices. <laughs> the whole point of the crust was that it enclosed the filling. The filling was what you ate. And you could nibble at the crust if you felt like it. But it wasn't supposed to be this ideal combination of a friable coating on an interesting filling. Here's a totally different kind of pie. It's a detail of a Stoskopf still life. And it's meant to contrast with the fragility, almost the invisibility, of the glasses in the basket on the right. And this shows in amazing detail the contents of a pie which was built to last. The whole point of sending game or meat to a friend was that, well the disadvantage, not the point, was that it would go off during a long journey. But if you baked it in a pie with a very, very solid crust, the heat of the baking would neutralise the bad bugs and the carapace, the very, very heavy, hard flour coating would keep anything else from outside getting at it. So that food could journey for up to a week in a pie and be kept good and wholesome. And you can see how this, which is probably chicken, maybe rabbit, has been larded with great lumps of fat stuff through it. But the thickness of the crust and the simple jelly surrounding the meat is a wonderful gift. Back to the fish markets of the Netherlands. Um, there's always a Bible story in the background, which is supposed to be a pretext. Um, the miraculous cast of Catholic <coughs> is happening there. But the real interest is in the lifelike depiction of the different kinds of fish. Even when you do get them occasionally crossed over each other in the form of a cross, like the salted herrings um, up there, but we'll move on and look at a naturalistic drawing, another fish, a gurnard for Ulysse Aldrani. Alongside the naturalism of the painters, there was this passionate interest in the detail of the natural world that the naturalists were exploring. More fish here in a scene of low life by Velasquez which prefigures in some ways um, the last few slides I'm going to show you. Here she is very specific. Again, we've got the Bible story in the background, Christ in the house of Martha and Mary. 
But what's going on in the foreground is she's making a sauce with garlic and eggs for the fish which she's about to fry. But the critical thing here is this, which is a very early sighting of a red chili. You get them in the south of Spain and in the south of Italy and in Naples, but not in Madrid, as we'll discover later. Here's another scene of real life, another bodygon, which again, you can read morals into it if you like, the wisdom of old age and the sulkiness of the youth, and she's showing him how to fry eggs perfectly. But what she's doing is interesting because she's not cooking at a kitchen fire. It's as if she's preparing an impromptu meal in a corner of the kitchen, and there is a very big jar, a bottom jar, that one, is holding a shallow dish, an earthenware dish of hot coals, and on that is the pot with the olive oil that she's frying eggs in. And that's an amazing kitchen detail, I think, that you don't immediately spot when trying to figure out what's happening in the painting. I think what will happen, since she's telling him how to fry eggs, which is a skill one needs, and he is not making eye contact, he's looking away, he's sulky, mm -hmm. he can send to fetch a melon and a flask of wine, and that's bad enough as it is. And you know that in about 10 years' time he will be saying to his wife, oh, you don't know the first thing about frying eggs. Now, my grandmother did them perfectly. <laughs> and there's a sort of deduction there that one might make, but what is of more interest is, again, another sighting of chilies. Sorry, that's an onion, those are the chillies. Right. How are we doing for time? Do you want to go on a bit longer? I've got lots of stuff. <laughs> so I don't want to send you to sleep. <laughs> anyway, here's another bean stew, Anibale Karachi again. And this always puzzles me because it's the details of a fairly ordinary, everyday meal a bowl of black-eyed beans, some spring onions to give them a bit of oom, and a sort of vegetable pasty, probably a spinach tart um, in the dish here. Again, it's been broken up and not cut into neat slices. But he's wearing quite a nice laundered white shirt. He's eating off a fresh white tablecloth and he's drinking wine from a Maiolica jug out of a nice glass goblet. So you can't just say, oh, this is a coarse person eating coarse food. It's a puzzle. Here is a different kind of meal altogether. Late medieval Paris, Les Trois Dames de Paris. They told their husbands that they were going on a pilgrimage. And they went to the nearest tavern and they ordered a lot of good food, as you can see from the menu. And they were quite picky about their wine, you can see them here, um, tasting it, discussing it. Things went from bad to worse, and um, in a few hours they were all in an alcoholic coma, um, taken up for dead, and wheeled away to the Cimetière des Innocents, where they were rescued by their distraught husbands. <laughs> Here's another kind of meal happening in Paris, with various interesting distractions as well as food. But what is fun is the enormous detail of the meal they're having, um, the detail of the knife, knives, the bowls, and the beautiful embroidered tablecloth. So you're getting um, a popular theme of quite a lot of versions of this happy scene, and also a lot of interesting domestic detail. Here's another meal. It's part of a much larger painting which is described as the Hunt Picnic by Carlo Carmen. This is just a little bit. Um, whether it was a hunt or not, I don't know. The men have guns and dogs, but they have this rather hand dog expression as if they haven't actually come home with anything to do a barbie with. So the meal is 
has all been prepared in the house, which you can see in the background, by herself, who seems to be the most dominant personality of the painting. And the salad in front of her is a wonderful example. You get descriptions in contemporary cookery books. You get descriptions of the um, Genoese salad, which involves bread soaked in oil and vinegar and various kinds of fishy things. And here it is, in the flesh, as it were. It's a wonderful document. Another kind of meal altogether is by Bassano. He was working in Northern Italy and producing scenes for clients which were usually based on Bible stories or something from the scriptures, but this is classical. It's Antony and Cleopatra's banquet, mm. the most competitive dinner party in history. <laughs> but it's also a wonderful depiction of contemporary banquet. Um, those of you who know Bartolomeo Scatti and his wonderful lists of recipes, um, at about the middle to the end of his book, enormous menus in which there'd be about 20 or 30 dishes in a meal, perhaps six courses. Um, how were they served? How did people eat them? Well, you can see from the detail of the table that they were brought in and piled up, balanced on top of each other, on top of the rims, rather like a Chinese banquet. This would have been plate, which you can see the servant getting up top right, getting down from the credenza. And you can also see all the other food being put, brought together. The cook with the knife in his hand and the red hat is scrutinising something that's just been brought in from the kitchen. And you've got, again, an exotic pet monkey, a little kitchen boy being taught by the kitchen maid how to put a fowl on uh, a spit. But to go back to the detail, we have in the background, above Anthony's head, um, Monte Grappa, which to anyone who loves Italian food has to be a sacred spot. And we also see Cleopatra removing a priceless earring from her mm -hmm. ear which she's about to dunk into a bowl of vinegar, which has been <laughs> held for her. This puts the unit cost of her meal up. It's stratotherapy, so she won. <laughs> but what we have in this painting is this extraordinary connection of modern day realism and a classical story, and something very surreal about the background. You can't tell whether it's indoors or outdoors. And Bassano, with all this accurate realism, was also producing these almost surrealist landscapes and architectural images. Here's another kind of meal. Only three people, the couple in the middle and the man on the left being waited on by eight servants, but wonderful um, detail of the food which could be gone into by a historian of the period. And note that it's not an embroidered tablecloth, these are fresh herbs and flowers perfume here. Another kitchen scene where again you have in the background Christ and the house of Martha and Mary and the perspective lines of the painting all lead towards that chunk, taking you straight to the religious message, which I don't think anyone really cared about because the details of the kitchen are so interesting. Here we have another kitchen scene. Um, it's not often you see a cook joint me, which we have here on the left. But we also have more symbolism. We've got the fairly crude phallic symbolism of shoving um, <laughs> spit up into the soft entrails of the chicken. Um, spit galonfin, 
but the poor young man is holding a dead dog. There's a dead cockerel hanging up on the left, and he's holding a drug in his hand. Remember what we said about drugs? It's on its side and it's no lid. Mm -hmm. um, there are all kinds of iffy suggestions in the background, particularly the fact that he's young and slightly embarrassed and she is mature and amused by the whole setup. Here's another girl, another drug on its side. She has her eyes full of tears, not because she's chopping onions, but because of the loss of virtue. Uh -huh. So we are supposed to imply. Again, you have the dead birds and all the other symbolism of um, immoral behaviour. But I welcome this painting because it's such a accurate depiction of how the quantities of onions were chopped quite finely. Mm -hmm. That particular tool she's holding in her right hand in that shallow tray. And it's that sort of detail that I think has to be um, rescued from the symbolism, really. <laughs> and now we come to the last few images. And this is the most um, intriguing of all. This is Melinda, who was working in Madrid in the late 18th century. And he studied at the Royal Academy of Arts. And you can see in his proud self-portrait, he was going to be an artist in the classical tradition among the top in Madrid. He would get great commissions. He would be a huge success. He had all the skills. He had the motivation. And then his old father who helped found the academy, quarreled with the committee, and he and his son were excluded. And he ended up being a still life painter, not painting histories or group portraits or mythological or biblical scenes. And everyone has, art historians have tended to suggest that this was something rather shameful, really. He was only doing still life died in poverty and wasn't very successful. And they are the most, some of the most superb food still lives in existence. And for years they've been discussed in terms of the composition, the geometry, the fact that it's just a load of kitchen stuff, but look at the way it's composed the painting. And for a long time I saw that, and then I thought, well, he had to have a theme. He couldn't paint without a subject or a topic. So what is going on here? He had to have a theme. What is the theme? And I think this painting, which you know you could almost do a whole seminar on it, is the Cosido Madrileño, a particular kind of beef stew with tocino and garlic and herbs and onions and so forth. And this set me thinking, what about the other paintings? And once you realise that he had a very strict agenda for every painting he did. You then can find recipes in them. And I think this is the most exciting breakthrough. What we have here are two bream waiting to be cooked in a long-handled frying pan. And in the background there is a brass pestle in water, and that is going to be used to make the sauce. The sauce will be made of olive oil from oil. This canister here, bitter orange juice, garlic, and something in that little packet. And this is a classic recipe for fried bream with the sauce of garlic, bitter orange. And I think the little paper packet must probably have peppercorns because if there had been um, chilies around, they would have painted chilies. So this would either be the <coughs> flavourings of the period, which I think would be peppercorns. I've not seen one in one of its paintings, but you might find them. Or cinnamon or nutmeg. But the thing about this is there isn't a superfluous item in the painting. It really is a recipe. And having sneered at the description of the geometry and the composition and how these were not abstracts, at all. I realise that the geometry holds everything together. The, the use of diagonals and straight lines and curves and the way they relate to each other. 
He's making the recipe work. So he was applying his classical training to serious gastronomy. And then he used the final image, which for years I thought was just the apotheosis of the cauliflower. Just is the most glorious picture of the cauliflower kitchen stuff in the background. And then having looked at other recipes, it occurred to me that there could be a recipe behind this. What is amazing is that French fashion and French food was predominant in aristocratic circles in Spain at the time. Melendez's clients were aristocratic, but they were buying paintings like this to put on their walls. It was a sort of fingers up to French snobbery and French cuisine, but they were celebrating local Spanish popular cuisine. And what we have here is a recipe called bacalao e coliflor, which was made for either Christmas Eve or Easter, a vegetarian dish, meatless, and you can see the bacalao, bacalao sauce, the onions, the eggs, and probably another packet which would have more salt cod in it, but he had to show the real thing, even though it is not particularly beautiful to look at. Then, apart from the cauliflower, we have the canister of oil again, the garlic and the little paper packet for the spices. So we have what looks like just a striking kitchen picture. We have a wonderful popular recipe. This is popular in Asturias, which is where the eldest son of the King of Spain, um, he was like Prince of Wales, Prince of Asturias. So, and this was in his collection, so you can see there was a connection there. So, um, I've gone on far too long, but what I've just tried to show is what fun you can have looking for things to eat in paintings. And what the pitfalls are, what you have to be aware of, all the other different elements beside what you see is what you get. So, um, there's room for lots more work by all of us. So let's get on with it. <laughs> Thank you. investigations of our own. Um, I, I, I am conscious of the time. I'm sure we've all got lots of questions, but there is a little bit of cheese and fruit and more wine to, to sit in the middle. Um, so I, I don't know whether we could devote five minutes to questions now, but probably not much more than that, because really we, we mustn't sort of strain the resources, very generous resources, of the Guildhall Library too much. Um, so I, I know Jenny will be around, obviously, having in a book myself to chat to. Um, is, does anyone have a burning question or share with everybody right now? I'd just like to point out that for any who might have had difficulty in hearing any of it, when it goes up on YouTube, you can turn the volume up. <laughs> <laughs> right. Okay. Well, I have more questions. Yes, please. Gillian, uh, when um, there are religious or other scenes in the background of a painting, is this to confer respectability in some sense on what was otherwise might be considered demeaning as a kitchen uh, image? Yes, it could be. Yeah. Okay. Just a thought. Mm -hmm. 